Good morning, everybody. We're starting our second lecture for Chapter 6 in Thermodynamics. Uh, the subject today is refrigerators and heat pumps. So we are beginning at Section 6.4. So let's go over to the document cam and talk about what is a refrigerator and what is a heat pump. Okay, let's talk about refrigeration first of all. Now, I'm looking for a good pen here. Oh, there we go. Here we go. All right, so refrigeration and heat pump. Um, so basically, the purpose of a refrigerator is to move warm air uh, from a, let's say move colder air, really would be the better way, air from a cold space and push it to a warmer space. So in other words, this is exactly backward of the natural order of heat movement. All right. So Normally, what happens with heat is that if you have um, just any sort of a space, let's just let's do an unplugged refrigerator just because I like that. An unplugged refrigerator. It's an old style one where the freezer is on the top and the refrigerated space is on the bottom. If this space is cold and it's in your kitchen and temperature is higher here than it is here, what will happen is heat will naturally move from the higher temperature space into the lower temperature space and the lower temperature will increase until it approaches um, T sub H. Now, the thing that prevents this happening very quickly is that this refrigerated space is very well insulated. But eventually this effect will occur. Now, back in the old, old days, even before my time, People did not really have refrigerators. They had things called ice boxes. And once in a while, if you go to an antique store, you can see one of these. And they're usually wooden, and on the inside there's metal. And then up here there is a compartment for an actual chunk of ice. And what happens is as the ice, they would people would come around like every week and bring you a big block of ice. And as the ice melts, it cools off the space. And the metal part here transmits that coolness into the space pretty well. And then you would have um, something that would gather the water at the bottom so you could throw it out. So this operates quite a bit differently. But how does a modern refrigerator work? Well, the answer is, once again, that is my stylized symbol for a plug-in. Um, if you do not plug your refrigerator in, it will not run. And that's kind, of the, that's kind of the guts of the whole thing. So what does it mean when you plug something in? You put power into the system. And power, as we know in, uh, in thermodynamics, is W dot into the system. So in other words, a short statement of refrigeration is, is to make heat flow go backward to the natural order of things, you have to put work in, okay? And what that work does is it puts refrigerant through a series of phase changes. The work in um, puts a refrigerant through phase changes.
in such a way that heat is absorbed and rejected where and when it is desired. So just like when we draw a heat engine, when we were talking about Calvin Planck, we said this is, this is like, to me, this is the engineer's version of a stick figure, right? We have QH at T sub H, QL at T sub L, and work out, okay? So this is like a furnace um, or something powering a, uh, a work producing device. And so this is the, I used to always do this, I do this sometimes for you guys. This is Ernie, that's our spokes model. In the same way that this is a stick representation of a human being, this is a stick representation of a heat engine. They don't really look like this, right? Just like Ernie doesn't really look like this. Okay, but um, so Ernie, our spokes model, is showing us what a heat engine looks like. Well, a refrigerator obviously doesn't actually look like this either. But what happens is we wish to reject a heat to T sub L and we wish to absorb heat from, sorry, to T sub H and we wish to uh, absorb heat from T sub L and we do that by putting work into the system. All right, now if you think about it, this is the cycle that accomplishes that goal. But where are we pulling Q out of? Well, if we're running a refrigerator, our refrigerator actually is happening outside of the cycle, okay? Now it's not physically outside of the cycle, but what we're saying is the refrigerated space is being acted upon by this power being put in and we drive the heat in the opposite way. So if we are talking about a refrigerator, if you, you don't have to right now, but in your books on page 284, they draw a pretty good um, representation. And what you have on a refrigerator is sort of a four appliance cycle. And what happens is um, you have a compressor or a motor and that is where you put the work in. So you compress a fluid. Why do you compress a fluid? Well, you compress a fluid so that you can make this cycle um, do what you want it to do. And what you have is a refrigerant circulating in a system of tubes. And on one side, after you've compressed the fluid, you expel heat, Q sub H, uh, to T sub H. And in this example, if we're talking about a refrigerator, a domestic refrigerator, we're expelling that to the kitchen. Now, you may have seen in, um, if somebody in your family has an older refrigerator, they used to have coils on the back. Now it's underneath, it's all inside. But sometimes you would have coils on the back of the refrigerator. And if you ever put your hand on the, on the coils of the refrigerator, they would feel hot. And that's actually what's happening is the heat is being expelled there. Now another thing, uh, those coils would always collect grease and dust from the kitchen. And as they collected grease and, du and dust, the refrigerator would actually stop working as well. So you would have to clean off the coils um, on the back of the refrigerator. Why do you suppose the grease and the dust would cause the refrigerator to work less efficiently? That's exactly right. It acted as an insulator on the coils or on the um, condenser. And 
it would then not expel the heat as well. So in other words, and the way that those used to look, I, you, I don't know. I don't know if you guys have ever seen these. Maybe if you're in rental, if you're in a rental apartment, you may have older refrigerators. But like if this is the back of the refrigerator, there would just be like, like this, like black, generally speaking, black coils all the way and down the back. And that was just the, um, that was just the condenser. Okay. So then what happens is the refrigerant uh, continues to cycle and there is an expansion valve at a location. And once again, this is all happening outside of the refrigerated space. Um, and what the expansion valve would do is it would take a liquid and flash it into a vapor. Okay. And then this vapor would uh, go through an evaporator, just like it sounds, just evaporate something. And this is in order for this process to occur. If you think about it, if you have a liquid and it becomes a vapor, vapors tend to have higher specific heats or higher H values or higher U values, right? So it requires energy. So you force the uh, vaporization and then in order to maintain that state, the fluid requires heat. And since you have it positioned at the refrigerated space, where is it going to get the heat from? Well, the only place it can get it from is the refrigerated space. So what happens then is through this process of um, evaporation, the only heat that's available is Q sub L. And so Q sub L, or heat from the low temperature reservoir, is sucked out of the refrigerator and put into the vapor. All right, so then you have a vapor or two phase coming back. It needs to be compressed, put work into the compressor to turn it back into a liquid. Comes back here to the condenser, rejects heat into the kitchen uh, by being condensed. Then comes the expansion valve, is vaporized again, pulls heat out of the refrigerated space and continues the cycle. Now, the deal about this is it's really cool, first of all. I mean, refrigeration really modernized our life, made our food. Oh, go ahead. Some more. Do you mind if we just kind of like summarize, I guess? Sure. Absolutely. Liquid. Yes. Is condensed. Well, this is kind of, this can't, this is a vapor. Right. It's not a vapor yet, though, right? Well, it could be. Yes, it is. And then since it's a cycle, where does it start? I started at the condenser because that's where it's plugged in. Okay. Okay. But you could start this anywhere and it works exactly the same way. But so basically you have a vapor coming out of um, the evaporator. So in other words, you've just pulled a bunch of heat out of the refrigerator, out of what we consider to be the refrigerator, mm -hmm. right? So you've pulled heat out of it and you've, you've forced a vaporization by decreasing the pressure in the expansion valve. So then that draws heat in order to maintain that vapor state. So then as you go back into the compressor after you've finished with the refrigerator, because here's like actually this is where you've got your, you know, your milk and your grapes and so forth down here. Um, and so you ha then you have a vapor. So you put it into a compressor to compress it into a liquid. So when you do that, um, you have to expel heat in order to get it ready to be vaporized again. So you expel heat to the kitchen. Okay, through the condense or um, yeah, condenser, compressor, condenser. Sorry, the two words are similar. They are not similar in any way. But uh, so you go through the condenser, you expel the heat, and so what you have then is a liquid. You, that liquid goes through an expansion valve, which this is just a symbol for an expansion valve. Um, and what that does is you reduce the pressure of the liquid which vaporizes it, which leaves it energy starved, essentially. Mm -hmm. So it looks for energy. I mean, I'm giving it sentience, but right. Pulls the energy in from the refrigerated space. And then, so we have a vapor. We have a heated, low pressure vapor. So high, um, higher temperature, lower pressure vapor. And then we condense it and do the whole thing again. So we condense it back to a liquid and then expel the heat, because now we have a hot liquid. 
expel the heat through, that's why it has to be non-insulated, right? That's why the old coils have to be non-insulated because you want to expel that heat right. so that you can start the process all over again. So how did they make that process more efficient? <laughs> how did they make that process more efficient? <laughs> Well, that's a really good, that's a really good question. Um, one of the most important things, yeah, what's that? There's still a condenser, it's just underneath now, and it's really a design feature. I, I don't know that it makes it more efficient, but what they do now is, if you look at the back of a refrigerator, it's usually just a flat metal right. sheet. So that there's not... Exactly, because those can get broken, and if they get broken, then your refrigerator quits working. Right, and so people, you know, I don't know, I would say in modern times, people want to push their refrigerators against the wall, you know, or they just want to have more flexibility than having a, um, a working exposed space. exposed space. Right, there you go, exactly behind the refrigerator, which the best way to do it is, if you have an old coiled, if you have an old coil refrigerator, the best way is to keep it pulled out several inches from the wall, and then keep the coils dusted all the time. Now what they do is they put them underneath and sometimes they'll even have a fan on them to drive the heat away. Okay. So if it's inside, they just drive it with, um, an with an external fan. Right, exactly. So, and well, it is really interesting. The other thing I think is, this is something that just dawned on me um, not that long ago. So takes me a while, but that's okay. If you look at like first generation refrigerators, up until very recently, mostly refrigerators had the freezer section up here and the refrigerated section up here. And then, you know, in, I mean, in the last 20 years or so, sometimes you'll see a freezer side by side, or sometimes now you'll see the French door refrigerator um, and the freezer compartment down here. Okay, when you're running a cycle like this, it is irrelevant what the configuration is. However, um, back in, uh, it, th the reason that we started with this configuration, I believe comes from the icebox times. Because what happened um, was you had your block of ice up here. So this is gonna be coldest, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, so just this configuration, I believe is kind of just a leftover from that. And then I've, I kind of missed this part. I, I've seen in antique stores, old fashioned ice boxes, um, or even like my little office refrigerator is just a single door. But when you open it up, there's just like a small refrigerated space here. You know, it's just like a dorm fridge with a latch on it. And then there's a tray underneath here and then there's the refrigerated space. Well, I think all of this is just sort of a leftover from this design. But um, some old, old refrigerators actually had um, like a like a condenser up here, you know, which is just really, really strange. So you would see like there'd be almost this little neck and then this sort of a bubble looking thing on top. And I think all of those are sort of throwbacks to the idea of your ice was on top and it's just sort of, the cold just sort of drifted down. So, but then, so like I said, there's really no reason to not have a configuration like this or like this. But it took quite a while for those to become more common. So are the, the coils, the system, is it going to be closer to the freezer wherever? No, that's a really good point. Um, what really happens, you can have two systems, mm -hmm. uh, or like if you have, let's talk about, um, and that's an excellent, excellent question. Um, what we're really trying to do is we try to establish a particular temperature at a relatively human pressure, okay? In other words, and we also like to have a refrigerant that is not poisonous or flammable, hazardous. And by nature, where the refrigerant makes these changes, what pr when I say where, I mean what pressure and temperature these changes occur, where it becomes a, a vapor, where it becomes a liquid, what pr and when I say where, I mean pressure and temperature. You want to have something that is in human, um, in human condition. In other words, ammonia, for example, is an extremely effective refrigerant, gets things to a very low temperature, but for domestic use, it's a terrible choice because it's poisonous. And um, if the flare, if flashing occurs at high pressures, 
every one of your fittings and all of your tubing has to be industrial quality. So you wouldn't want to have a situation where somebody might move a refrigerator and bump a coil and end up spewing ammo uh, you know ammonia gas right into their into their kitchen. So all of this is kind of um, is kind of engineered to happen at certain kinds, so certain types. So another example of that expansion valve is like when in 1993, if you have if you ever have a, a vehicle that's 1993 or older, um, the refrigerant that they used in a car was R12. And after 1993, refrigerant was changed to R134A, which are very similar. We've talked about this a little bit. But the reason for this was is that um, R12 has a chlorofluorocarbon and um, there's some fairly established science and quite a bit of established politics that indicate that the chlorocarbon actually created an imbalance in ozone, which is O3, which is kind of a, a strange molecule of oxygen, but it creates a different uh, climate condition, possibly in the upper atmosphere. So when R12 was banned from usage, we went to R134A. Now, you can't put R134A directly into an existing R12 system because everything flashes at slightly different places. So the other problem is um, R134A is flammable. So technicians who put R134A into cars had to be trained so that they didn't catch on fire. So it's not really hard. You don't hear about it happening. I mean, so I shouldn't say it's not really hard. They obviously have mastered this, but you just have to be a little bit more careful. Uh, and you have to just know what it is. So you could, if you had a, a car that was older than 1993, you can have it re, uh, re-jetted, I guess would be the correct word, or re uh, valved for R134A, but you can't just put one because it won't work. You'll put it at a particular pressure and temperature, it won't turn into a vapor, and then nothing will happen. So, does that yeah. answer your question a little bit? Yeah. So, anyway, I think refrigeration is just extremely cool. But um, so, if you have a domestic, if you have a, a refrigerator in your house, what we're really getting at, and this is an interesting engineering problem. We just want to meet certain specifications. Like I said, we don't want it blowing up. We don't want it to be hazardous or flammable or poisonous. Um, we want it to be relatively easy and safe to work on. We want leaks in the system to not occur, but if they do occur, we don't want them to be harmful to people. And um, we also want the refrigerated space, the temperature in the freezer, and the temperature in the refrigerator to be at certain conditions. In other words, um, I can't even remember what those temperatures are. But like if you have a deep freeze, if you have a chest freezer or an upright freezer, the temperature um, here is going to be lower than the temperature would be in your refrigerator, obviously, and is also lower than you would have in a domestic refrigerator. Okay? Then if you have like uh, coolers, like walk-in coolers, if you had a commercial meat packing business, for example, you have to have different temperatures in order to do different features of, um, of meat processing. So, I think so. Let's find out. Let's find out, because that is an excellent question. Let's take a look at the podium PC and find out what is the temperature, operating temperature is what they call it, operating temperature. Good question as well. Let's find out. Operating temp because see you've worked with this before, so yes. you have a lot of really in yeah. So I'll, it is connecting some stuff, which is really great. So the operating temperature of a um, residential. Oh, there's a refrigerator. Okay. So the ideal. There you go. Re ideal refrigerator temperature is 35 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and that's for food prep, food preservation, right? So let's take a look at a freezer. And then you'll see there are also ultra low freezers, but a freezer, um, so zero degrees Fahrenheit. Um, food stored at zero Fahrenheit is or below is safe to eat indefinitely. Well, I would <laughs> beg to differ. <laughs> but, so, and then like if you have 
let's see, commercial freezers, if those are, sometimes they're called ultras, sometimes they're a little bit, yeah. Yeah, it says, it's, wh where's your food stored safely? And there we go. So you just want to make sure that you have um, those temperatures met. Now, one of the things that, especially, this is for everybody, but um, even though they call them coolers, um, sometimes what we're really talking about is just a temperature controlled unit. So like if you go into a walk-in cooler, um, like at a convenience store or something like that, the temperature may be different depending on what what you need, you know, what it is that you're doing with it. So if you're keeping, um, I remember for example, this was just a, gosh, 20 years ago or 15 years ago, um, I was talking to some people who owned an IGA store and they said that if in order, they, they had racks and racks and racks of cold uh, sodas and iced teas and stuff. And they found out that if they just had a few, like if they just got a little thing where you could get a cold drink out of this, this little place and kept everything else warm, they would save thousands of dollars a month on cooling bills. So, and especially because if you think about like, if you go into a grocery store, see now you now get to look at the world a little differently. If you go into a grocery store, and you look at where they keep the cold drinks, um, it's open, right? I mean, a lot of grocery stores keep that in an open area. Well, you're bleeding off tons of refrigeration dollars into the store atmosphere. So keeping something in an insulated space behind a door, and especially if it's small, you'll have much better, um, much better heating bills, which is what when you plug something in, once again, that's what else we're talking about is heating bills. So let's take a look at um, refrigerants. Let's see if we can find anything about that. Uh, different refrigerants currently in use, uh, used in refrigeration systems. There we go. All right. So there we go. Industrial refrigeration. Um, Oh, and CO2 is a really neat one as well. Water kind of works, so here we have some different ideas. Um, <clears throat> no refrigerants fit the requirements 100% of all cooling plants. So that's once again, which refrigerant you use requires an engineering uh, decision. So here we have the R134A, which is common in air conditioners in cars, um, ammonia, is the most common refrigerant in industrial cooling systems. Um, and it has an R designation as all, well. so I guess that's a little scarier than, a little less scary if you say it's R717 rather than saying ammonia gas. But um, actually ammonia is an awesome refrigerant. It's just not very safe. Um, and all refrigerants, I shouldn't say all refrigerants, but a lot of refrigerants are just not really the kind of things that we find in everyday life. They're not, they don't tend to be really human friendly um, fluids because they're doing something kind of contrary to, to nature. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm saying that as a big fan of refrigerants. Um, anyway, so CO2 uh, is an awesome refrigerant as well. Um, and we, you know, so it just talks a little bit about the pros and cons. And if you read things like this, you will see that all of them um, have pros and cons. And these are really like engineering decisions, you know. So what you use is what's best for what you use, okay, or what you need it to do. And water being used as a refrigerant uh, is awesome because, first of all, it has a really high specific heat. So it pulls away heat very, very well. Um, but it doesn't flare till you get to um, high pressures and temperatures. And also it doesn't really cool that well if your ambient temperature is extremely high. So, um, so those are just some ideas. Now hydrocarbons are really interesting as well. For example, if you guys have ever like had gone to a, bar a gas, like a propane barbecue grill. And if you open up the valve, which your parents probably would yell at you for doing, but if you open up the valve on propane, what you'll see is if you put your hand on it, um, it'll get very cold because the expansion of propane does exactly what we're talking about. And you expand propane, it gets cold and it pulls heat in. 
okay? So, like, if, you're, if you have a camper, a camper trailer, and you have a propane refrigerator, that's actually what you're doing is you are burning propane to keep the space of your refrigerator cool, which is kind of a weird deal, but there it is. And you have to burn it because after you flare it, you can't just send it out into the atmosphere because it's flammable. So you have a controlled burn to control that process. So anyway, kind of interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So, and like I was saying earlier, if you were a refrigeration tech, if you wanted to do this for a living, um, you could make a lot of money. So it's, it's, a great, it's a great profession for somebody who is interested in technical things like this. All right, so let's talk about this. When we talked about heat engines, and then we're gonna have, I'm gonna do two different things today. When we talked about heat engines, we talked about NTH or thermal efficiency. And we said NTH is always less than or equal to one because what we're really talking about is how much heat we are turning into work. Uh, when we talk about refrigeration cycles, we talk about not a thermal efficiency because we're not generating work, but we talk about a coefficient of performance. Coefficient of performance for a refrigerator because it once again, if I draw my stick figure, I'm paying work in to suck away, um, if this is my refrigerator, it says Q sub L, right? So my desired effect is to move Q sub L. So I put that on the top, and what I have to pay for is the work that I put in. So Q sub L, work in then is going to be Q sub H minus Q sub L, lacking anything else. Because in order, because we still have to have a first law balance, right? So if we put work in, that this is going to be the amount of work because these are the amounts of energy, and we can uh, divide each thing by Q sub L, and we get one Q sub H over Q sub L minus one as another expression for the coefficient of performance. Now the thing I'd like to point out is, in no way does COP coefficient of performance have to be less than one. Because we're not talking about generating electricity or generating power. All we're talking about is moving power from one side of a cycle, to not power, moving energy from one side to the other. So we're not creating anything. So coefficient performance um, could be seven, could be 15, could be 12. There are other limits that we reach based on reversibility of the cycle, efficiency and reversibility of the cycle, but in no way does the coefficient of performance have to be less than one. So you really don't express it as a percent, okay? So in other words, we can express thermal efficiency as less than or equal to one or some percent, right? We can express it like it was a nine. If this value is 0.9, we could call it 90%. Coefficient of performance is just a number. It really doesn't make sense to express it as a, um, as a percent. All right. So having said that, there is another thing. If you ever... I always like, if you ever stay in a motel and you have a little unit, this is like the old fashioned motel, not necessarily a thermostat, but you might have a unit in the window that you can turn to heat or you can turn to fan or you can turn to cool. And it's the same unit. Well, how does it know? The answer is that uh, if you're heating, it's called a heat pump. And a heat pump is mechanically the other side of a wall unit air conditioner. So you just, re you just reverse the direction of heat flow. So in this particular case, let's talk about if you have an air conditioner unit in your window. You get cold air this way, right? Let's say T sub L and you get hot air this way. So if you go outside, if your air conditioner unit is in the window, you're in your house, and you go outside and you put your hand on the back of the air conditioner, which of course, once again, has to be plugged in because as I said, I mean, I'm kind of being a smart aleck when I say it, but it will not work if you unplug it. I will guarantee it. Um, none of these will. Uh, if you put your hands on the back of the air conditioner, it will be hot. Well, the hot side of the air conditioner is just a heat pump, okay? So whether, um, and there are mechanical differences. I mean, it's not, 
as simple as I'm making it, but basically a heat pump works exactly the same way as a refrigerator, just you're looking at the back side. Exactly. So there are some relationships. Um, so we looked at the coefficient of performance for a refrigerator right here. And we can also look at the coefficient of performance for a heat pump. And a coefficient for performance of a heat pump is just, once again, instead, this time we're not looking for Q sub L, we're looking for Q sub H, okay? But the required input is still the work that we have to put in. So if you take a look at the coefficient of performance for a heat pump and the coefficient of performance for a refrigerator, you'll see that this one is Q sub H over work in, and this one is uh, Q sub L over work in, and it turns out that if you subtract these, you will get Q sub H minus Q sub L over work in, which is just work in over work in, which is one. So the mathematical relationship is that the coefficient of performance for a heat pump, if it's the same machine, minus the coefficient of performance from the refrigerator is going to equal one, okay? And I always just like to put that out there because I think it's more satisfying to have a mathematical relationship, especially because coefficient of performance, if it turns out to be like 9 or something like that, it's just um, kind of a strange idea. All right, so this leads us to, we've talked about refrigeration, we've talked about coefficient of performance, and so the last thing that we need to do is to come up with another statement of the second law of thermodynamics. So I already talked about the Kelvin Planck statement, which is basically designed for heat engines, which says that you can't get work out unless you exchange heat with two reservoirs. Okay? The Clausius statement, which is more appropriate to describe which goes on with a uh, refrigerator, we expel to Q sub H, we suck in from Q sub L, and in order to do that, we have to put work in. So the Clausius statement says, this one says it's impossible to get work out of a cycle without exchanging heat with two reservoirs. This one says it's impossible to construct a device that operates in a cycle and produces no other effect than the transfer of heat from a low temperature body to a high temperature body. So both of them start out with the idea of it is impossible. Okay, and this one says it is impossible to transfer heat in this way with no other effect. In other words, once you unplug your refrigerator, it will quit working. Okay, so, um, and that, and, and the Clausius statement in its final form is written on page 288 of your textbook. But the one thing that I would mention is that the Clausius statement and the Kelvin-Planck statement are actually equivalent statements. And if you think about what they both are saying, is that you're gonna have to have heat exchange with two reservoirs and work either going in or out. So in other words, you can never exchange with a single reservoir, you can never exchange with two reservoirs um, without having some amount of network being done. And so the two statements are actually equivalent to each other. All right, uh, so do you guys have any questions at this point? And thank you for your in insight. I mean, it's very interesting to listen to somebody who's worked with this stuff because, you know, that's, that's what it all comes down to. As engineers, um, the theoretical is very interesting, but, you know, really the hands-on, it's everything. I mean, it's, it's poison, it's expense, it's, uh, you know, corrosiveness, it's everything. So, I was working again. R22 and R410A. R410A. And R22, R22 was being phased out. Phased out. Yep. Over the 90s, so we've been replacing. R22 is getting really expensive. So really yeah. Like right. I think R22. Um, I believe I used to have a international deep freeze. International yes, an IH deep freeze. I inherited it from somebody's grandparents. Um, and it weighed like 10,000 pounds and had an external compressor on it mm -hmm. that uh, I had when my husband and I first got married and went to college. So 
uh, R22 is a chlorodifluoromethane. See, they're all kind of the same sorts of molecules. Um, and the physical properties, you can see, this is all this is all engineering stuff, but this is really what we're interested in is like the latent heat of vaporization and where that happens, where the flaring occurs. Um, and then we have an ozone depletion potential, which is really interesting. These are kind of two new um, things. But so yeah, EPA's analysis. It was yeah. The most common the price. thing I got was that uh, <coughs> for R410A yeah. was not as efficient, but it was okay. safer. Okay. Here you go. So. Yep, look at that. So we'll take a look at that as well. But here's R22. You can see the price per pound, just like you said. Look at the price go up on that one. So that's kind of what happened. And it was up here for some reason. And then it went down again. Isn't that interesting? I wonder what year that was. Huh. Anyway, very interesting. Let's look at our 410A and let's see what the advantages are. There it is. Um, SUVA is zerotropic, near azeotropic, difluoromethane. So it's R32 mixed with something called R125, which is a pentafluoroethane. And environmental effects, um, it does not contribute to ozone depletion. So there you go. So there you go. <laughs> so, and then like you said here, see, this is the practical side of, of Jess's experience coming in. Um, R22 phase out, and so there you go. So that's exactly, you know, and those are important considerations. I um, I don't I don't mean to deprecate that in any way. You know, I mean, yeah. because every engineering decision that we make uh, always has. You know, it's like it's like the statement: "There's no such thing as a free lunch." Is like that is for us engineers. Everything <laughs> has <laughs> everything. Yes, everything has consequences, and you have to make decisions each and every time about about things like this. So, you know, I mean, it's just like people like who are involved in the industry may love, for example, ammonia, you know, but is it such a good idea? And like we were talking about burning hydrocarbons like in um, uh, propane refrigerators. Well, you have to have a supply of hydrocarbon. Theoretically, with, high, with, with traditional refrigerants that are operating in a cycle, you never really have a situation where you're you're if you're not you're not using up your refrigerant. You may have leaks and stuff, especially in cars. You know, you, so you have to recharge your system. But it's not like you're spending the fluid itself in any way. So in a refrigerator, if everything were working ideally, you would never really have to replenish the refrigerant. So those are all the kind of considerations that we have to make. So so there you go. But if you were living wild, if you had a little cabin out in the woods and you didn't have electricity, I think a propane refrigerator would be awesome because you still might want to, you know, keep your soda cold or whatever. Keep your, you know, food preservation is a big deal. And I don't want to eat jerky all, all year long. So, so refrigeration is a better deal. All right, gentlemen. Well, that's the second video for Chapter 6. We'll have one more on Thursday, and then I will, sometime between now and then, uh, put up the uh, homework assignment for Chapter 6. All right. Have a great day. Yes.